This lecture covers uh, some of the basic concepts behind uh, random effects models. So to, uh, to start, let's review uh, what the one-factor model is. So we have a factor variable with capital J levels. Our notation for the response is little yij. This is the response from the ith unit that received treatment j. So the, the levels of the factor are the different treatment levels. And we model yij with capital yij, a random variable, equal to little b0 plus little bj plus epsilon ij. Um, whenever we specify a model, we have to uh, write down the assumptions for the model. Um, in this case, the assumptions are that b0, b1, b2, up to b capital J are just numbers. Uh, there's no other assumptions uh, about these uh, parameters. Uh, but we do make assumptions about the epsilon ij's. We assume that the collection of all of these epsilon ij's follows a normal distribution with mean zero and variance sigma squared. Additionally, we assume that all of the epsilon ij's are independent of one another. This model is sometimes called a fixed effects model. Um, that's a slightly confusing term in, in um, my opinion because it's not that they're fixed and, and specified beforehand. Um, uh, in this case, fixed is synonymous with um, non-random. And when you think about fixed effects models, what I want you to the image I want you to have in your in your brain is that these effects, this B1 up to B capital J, um, are just numbers and there's no assumptions placed on the collection of these numbers, uh, little b1 up to uh, little bj. So think of fixed as um, uh, lacking assumptions. Now a random effects model is different in that it does uh, place an assumption on the collection of effects. Okay, so here's our first uh, random effects model. Um, so we're going in this model we we replace a little b sub j with big b sub j. Um, but otherwise the model's exactly the same. Let me scroll back. This was our fixed effects model. The random effects model is exactly the same, except we replace this with a capital B sub J. And um, B0 is still in the model. Um, the B0 is just a number. There are no assumptions are placed, placed on this number. Um, but now we place an assumption on the collection of these numbers, B sub 1 up to B sub J. And the assumption we place on them is that this collection of effects follows a normal distribution with mean zero and variance sigma one squared. Uh, we have the same assumption on uh, the epsilons, um, that they follow a normal distribution, but it has a different variance sigma two squared. So this, this collection of effects follows a normal distribution with one variance sigma one squared. This collection of um, errors or residuals follows another uh, normal distribution. Um, so what's different about the random effects model from the fixed effects model is we, we place a specific distributional assumption on the collection of these effects, B1 up to Bj. Um, the specific distribution that we pick is a normal distribution, um, and that's usually what people pick in practice, uh, but in principle you could pick other things. And this capital B, this reminds us that now we're assuming that the effects are random variables that follow some uh, distribution. So the assumption here is that if uh, capital J, the number of levels, was a large number, say 100 or 200, and we were able to observe these effects, B1 up to B100 or B200, and then make a histogram of them, that histogram would follow a bell curve or a normal distribution. All right, so let's, let's see what this looks like in a picture. Um, 
So the idea here is we're looking um, in this fixed effects model. Let me make this a little bigger. In this fixed effects model, we're making a histogram of the collection of effects. The collection of effects are this uh, little b1, uh, little b2, up to little b sub j. If we were able to see those things and make a histogram of them, um, that histogram could take on any shape. That is the assumption um, in the fixed effects model. It's really a lack of an assumption because we're saying it could take on any shape. So for example, uh, if you take the collection of the little b sub j's, it, the histogram could look like this, uh, where there's a, a peak here and then it goes down and then a big peak. So this is really not following a normal distribution. It could look like something like this, which is right skewed, uh, which is also not a normal distribution. Or it, it could look like a normal distribution. So the idea here is that we're, we're, saying, we're not saying that it necessarily follows a normal distribution, but it could. In the random effects model, we are making the assumption that the collection of effects in this case, which is big B1 up to big B sub J, uh, that this collection of effects does follow the normal distribution. So these two histograms uh, represent um, the assumption on the effects that we place in the random effects model. So we, we don't say beforehand what the variance is. Remember, we call the variance sigma 1 squared. So on the left is a normal distribution with a large variance and on the right is a normal distribution with a smaller variance. But in both cases, the collection of the effects follows a normal distribution. Uh, so this, this, what I want you to think about when you think about using um, a fixed effects model versus a random effects model is the difference between um, these pictures here. In the fixed effects model, we place no assumption on the collection of effects. Um, and therefore the histogram could look like anything, any of these pictures here. Uh, but in the random effects model, uh, we assume that the effects follow a normal distribution. So if you were to make a histogram of the effects, it would follow a bell curve. And that could be a, a wide bell curve or a narrow bell curve. So there are many different types of random effects models. We've looked at one example so far. So this is um, uh, the model with a single factor that we model as a random normal variable. There are many other types of random effects models um, and things can get pretty complicated. We'll look at a few of them here. But the sort of the, the key concept that you should keep in your head is that it's similar to the its fixed effect counterpart. Um, except you're placing an additional assumption on the collection of the effects, in, in particular that the, this collection of effects follows a normal distribution. Um, since this assumption um, we're making on the collection of effects or parameters, uh, it, it makes the most sense to think about random effects models when you have um, factor models, which have a collection of levels for the factor. Okay, so let's look at uh, some additional examples. Um, in this first example, you have uh, two factors, uh, factor one and factor two. Um, y, i, j, k is the response from the ith unit that received treatment j of factor one and treatment k of factor two. Um, one model you could write down is the first one here, y, i, j is little b, zero plus big b, j plus little ck plus epsilon ijk. In this model, we're assuming that the collection of effects due to factor one follows a normal distribution, but we're placing no assumption on the collection of effects due to factor two. Um, so we assume big bj or iid normal zero sigma one squared and epsilon ijk are uh, normal zero sigma two squared and I haven't written it down here, but all we're assuming about C1 up to C capital K is that they're numbers and we're not making any specific um, assumption about the histogram 
uh, for those numbers. Now, if you wanted to make an assumption about the collection of effects due to factor two, you could make it um, a normal random effect. So this, this model is exactly the same, except uh, we've capitalized the C sub K and placed an assumption, a normal assumption on the collection of effects due to factor two. Uh, some additional examples here. Um, so you can have, uh, anytime there's a factor in the model, you can consider whether you want to um, make the effects due to that factor uh, be normal random, random variables or not. Um, so this also applies to factor numeric models. Um, so in this example, um, yij is the response from the ith unit that received treatment j. Uh, but we also get to observe a numeric covariate uh, for that unit. Um, a random effects model, uh, which is an additive factor numeric model, uh, could be written like this. Yij is little a0 plus capital Aj plus b0 xij plus epsilon ij. Um, the assumption on the random effect a a sub j is that it follows a normal distribution. Um, the assumption on the residuals is also a normal distribution. So what we're saying here, remember that in the factor numeric additive model, um, the different levels of the factor have different intercepts with respect to the numeric covariate, uh, but they all have the same slope. So what you, we're assuming here in this random version of that model is that the collection of these intercepts which is little a0 plus big A1, little a0 plus big A2, up to little a0 plus big Aj, that this collection of intercepts follows a normal distribution. Uh, mean A0 and variance sigma 1 squared. You can also have a um, random effects model um, in the factor numeric interaction model. So that's what we have here at the bottom of the page. Uh, so this should look very similar uh, to our fixed effect factor numeric interaction model. But now I've capitalized uh, A sub J and B sub J. So what we're assuming here is that A sub J, this is a collection of normal random variables. Same thing for B sub J, uh, but they have a potentially different variance. So what we're saying here is in addition um, to the collection of intercepts following a normal distribution, the collection of the slopes, you have one, different, one slope for each level of the factor, also follows a normal distribution. Okay, so how do you estimate the parameters in the random effects model? Let's go back for one second to our simplest um, random effects model, the one factor model. That's this one here. Uh, so what are the parameters we want to estimate? So there's uh, B0 is the first parameter. There's no parameter associated with each of these. They're just random variables. The only parameter associated with um, this big B sub J is this sigma one squared, uh, which is the variance of the collection of random effects. And of course, we have the variance of the residual term, which is sigma two squared. So in this case, there's only three parameters, b0, sigma one squared, and sigma two squared. What sigma, sigma two squared measures the same thing as it's always measured. It's the, the variation in the response after accounting for the factor. With sigma one squared, this is the variation in the effects of the factor. So if we look at our histogram, this is a case where sigma one squared is large, and this is a case where sigma one squared is small. So one thing you'd be interested in estimating is what is the actual variation in the effects due to the factor? All right, so let's scroll back now that we have a, uh, an idea of what we're trying to estimate. Now in fixed effects models, we estimate the, the mean parameters, which is like the, the little b zeros or, or little bj's, uh, using least squares. And then we estimate the, the variance parameter, sigma squared, um, using the residual sum of squares criterion, 
um, divided by the residual degrees of freedom. Um, and, you know, we've sort of said that this is the right way to do it, um, uh, but there is an entire theory behind this estimation procedure. And um, this theory also fits into a more general estimation strategy called residual maximum likelihood. Um, now, in this class, we don't have, uh, we're not going to talk about um, the details of what residual maximum likelihood does. Um, but this is the method that's used to estimate the parameters in the random effects model. So to remind you, in that simple one-factor model, the parameters are B0, um, sigma 1 squared, which is the variation in the effects, and sigma 2 squared, which is the variation in the uh, response after controlling for the effects. Uh, one thing I will say is that uh, somewhat interesting, um, this technique called residual maximum likelihood was developed here at Cornell um, by a professor named Charles Henderson, who worked in the animal science department. Um, and this is the um, estimation technique that's used to estimate all the parameters in random effects models. Um, so we're not going to talk more about what that is, um, but I will um, go over how to actually do this in R, uh, and we'll talk about the LME4 package. There are other packages available for estimating uh, random effects models, but we'll just focus on one of them. The other one that's popular is called NLME. Okay, so now we have kind of an understanding of what the random effects model is doing. It, it places um, this additional assumption on the collection of the effects, namely that they follow a normal distribution. Um, so it it's often comes up that, well, I have a data set with a factor in it, and uh, should I use a random effects model or not? Um, and to be honest, there's a lot of folklore around um, this question. Um, so what I'm going to try to do here is to sort of cut through the garbage and um, and get to the point of, of why you would use a random effects uh, model or not. So some one of the things in the folklore is that you should use a uh, random effects model when you think that the uh, effects are random which is kind of just a restatement of the name of the model. I think that this is not a very good justification um, because the random effects model that we've talked about um, makes a specific assumption about the distribution of effects, namely that it follows a normal distribution. Um, now, if you merely think that the effects are random, it could follow any distribution. Uh, it doesn't have to be normal. So that alone is not enough to justify using a random effects model. Um, some other folklore is that you should make it a fixed effect when you care about uh, estimating uh, the actual effects uh, rather than just the variance of the effects. That's also not particularly satisfying um, because in random effects model it is possible to extract estimates of the individual random effects. I can show you how to do that in LME4. So that's also not particularly uh, satisfying justification. I think the, the easiest and most straightforward way to think about this decision is that the random effects model places an additional assumption on the collection of the effects. And so the thought process for whether or not you should impose this assumption are the same as for any other assumption you would make in a statistical model. So the thought process is, uh, to simplify this, just two steps. Number one, is the assumption close to co correct? Do you believe that the collection of effects follows a random distribution? Uh, or, sorry, a normal distribution. And number two, do the benefits of making the assumption outweigh the cost associated with it being wrong? So that, that one's a little bit more complicated, but the general idea here is that when you make an assumption, an additional assumption, that can uh, buy you things. That could um, improve the estimate of some other part of the model, or it can um, have computational benefits or, or something else. Um, it may be a natural question to ask why you should make uh, an assumption when you don't have to. You'd like to be as 
agnostic as possible. But like I said, assumptions can have benefits. So let me give you a sort of a non-statistical example. Um, when I drive to work, I have to navigate the roads in Ithaca. Um, and because Ithaca is a small city, I can safely make an assumption um, that there won't be severe traffic and that it'll take me a particular amount of time uh, to get to work. Um, now, this is an assumption that's not necessarily true. Um, so why would I make this assumption? Well, one, it could buy me time in the morning, meaning that I don't have to, if I lived in a more congested area with more unpredictable traffic, every morning I would have to wake up and check the news or some kind of website um, to determine the traffic level. And I would probably have to um, get up earlier just in case um, the traffic was bad on some particular morning. So by making this assumption, um, I buy myself time in the morning. Um, now, that assumption is nearly always correct in Ithaca, uh, that the roads will be free of traffic and navigable. But if I lived in a more congested area, then making that assumption, uh, when it's not likely to be true, uh, could cost me. Uh, could cost me by making me late for work um, if I didn't check the, the traffic. So the same is true in statistics. Um, you, you should think about whether the assumption is close to correct, and you should do it if it, it provides some benefit to you. Um, one such benefit for random effects model is, say you, if you have two factors in the model, if one of the factors has many levels and you're willing to assume that the collection of effects due to that factor with many levels follows a normal distribution, you can get sharper estimates of the other factor by making this um, this assumption about the the collection of effects for the first factor. Um, another thing um, that random effects can give you is it allows you to make a prediction. So suppose we're thinking about our, our model for the um, rat pups. Uh, we'll have an effect due to a treatment and we'll have an effect due to the male rat. So say each female rat is um, impregnated by um, a different male rat. Um, if we assume that the male rat effects follow a normal distribution, we could uh, take our data and estimate the variance due to the male rat effects, which in this case is sigma 1 squared. And then if we had a, another, we're intending to do in another experiment uh, with more male rats from the same source, um, we can assume that if we make this assumption, we can make a prediction about the, um, the, how big the effect due to this new set of male rats will be, meaning that um, if, if the new set of male rats come from the same population as the old set of male rats, then their effects will come from the same population of effects. And so we know that the... Um, this new male rats won't have some, you know, much larger effect than the ones that we've observed in the first sample. So this is uh, some, something useful that comes up a lot, that you can make a prediction by assuming that the new set of uh, levels will uh, behave similarly to the old set of levels. So that's just another example of an assumption that um, can, uh, can benefit you. Um, now, again, if you don't think that the new set of male rats will have the same collection distribution of the collection of effects, then uh, it can cost you uh, to make that assumption because you could be wrong about how the, the new male rats are behaving.